Amen. So we're continuing on. We're actually be wrapping up uh, the series that we've been going through the last uh, several weeks to, uh, co entitled Distinctive Doctrines. We're going through that Baptist acronym. Of course, we're ending in the letter T today, which stands for the two offices, which uh, we believe as Baptists that there are two offices within the local church, that of the pastor and of the deacon. Mm -hmm. So we're going to preach about that uh, this morning. And if you would, keep something in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and we're going to just go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 4. 1 Corinthians chapter 4. Mm -hmm. Of course, in chapter 12, we read about the fact that we are a body of believers, that there are many different components, just as our human body has, a, has many different parts, so is the local church. You know, local church is made up by many different people, and we all have different roles to fulfill within the local church. And two of those roles that uh, are distinct in the body are that of the pastor and of the deacon. And it's always important, I think, to kind of uh, point out the fact that just because there are certain people that are put in places of leadership, uh, it doesn't make anybody else less important. Everybody has a role to play. Everybody uh, has something to do within the local church. I mean, after all, what is the point of having a pastor or even a deacon? It's to serve as examples to the believers that those that would come and be part of that church could look to those individuals and say, this is how the Christian life is to be lived. So we should never think that just because we're not fulfilling one of these two offices that somehow we're a second-class Christian or, you know, we're not in full-time ministry. You know, the, our Christian life is full-time. You know, we do all things unto the glory of God. You know, whether it's in your job, whether it's in your family, you know, you're always living the Christian life. It's not just because you're put on staff or you lead a church that all of a sudden now you've, you've uh, you know, um, now you're more accountable for, for being right with God. You know, we all have that. We all have an important... Uh, uh, role to fulfill. Now, if you would, look there in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6. It says, In these things, brethren, I have transfigured uh, uh, to myself and to Apollos for your sakes, that you might learn not to think uh, of men above that which is written, that none of you be puffed up for one against another. For who maketh thee to differ from another? Or what hast thou that did, thou didst not receive? Now, if thou didst, not, uh, thou didst receive it, why dost thou glory as if thou hadst, hadst not received it? So, you know, we should always think of men, you know, not above that which is written. But in the same token, you know, we also should consider what is written, you know, and, and the, 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 the specifically I'm going to focus on the office of a pastorate. And it's, it's, uh, it's a subject I think a lot of people take for granted. It's a position that some, a lot of people are, are uh, downplaying a lot, you know, when you get into the home church movement and things like this. And we need to be careful not to do that. And that's why this is an important topic. You say, why, why, why should we even address this topic? Why should we even talk about pastors and deacons? Because it is something that is being uh, brought under attack today. You know, it is something that some people will be very dismissive about, and uh, it's not good. But all I want us to see right out, of the, right out of the gate is the fact that we all serve to the same end. Whether you're a pastor, whether you're a deacon, whether you're a church member, Whatever you are within the local church, we're all working towards the same goal. We all have the same thing in mind, at least we ought to. Go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and look at verse uh, 1 where we see this. It says in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 1, Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I would ha have you ignorant. You know that ye were Gentiles carried away unto these, uh, these dumb idols, even as you were led. Wherefore I give it unto you to understand that no man speaking by the Spirit of God calleth Jesus accursed. And that no man can say that Jesus is Lord, but by the Holy Ghost. Now there are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are different, uh, differences of administrations, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of operations, but it is the same God which worketh in all, all in all. So yeah, there are different diversities, right? We might have different gifts, one from another. There might be de, uh, different administrations. You know, one of us might serve a certain role within the local church and another, another role but it's the same God. He goes on and says, but the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. And that is the goal of the local church, to build up the local church, to edify the local church, and to reach the lost. So we're all called to serve to the same goal, and we're all called also to serve within our own capacity. Okay. <clears throat> Look there in verse 27. It says in verse 27, Now ye are the body of Christ and members in particular, and God hath set some in the church, first apostles, secondarily prophets, thirdly teachers. After that, miracles, then gifts of healings, helps, governments, diversities of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Are all workers of miracles? Have all the gifts of healing? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? But covet earnestly the best gifts, and yet I show unto you a more excellent way. And if you recall, he ends there and then moves on into, into chapter 13, 
which is the famous chapter about charity and makes the point that you know the greatest gift that any of us could possess is that of charity or what you know we would call today love that we would love one another so <laughs> it's very important to understand that you know there are there is a a rank and, and file order to a local church that there is a there is an order given to that there are those that are put in authority but we all serve to the same end and we should never be puffed up one for against another and we should understand that we're all serving to the same uh, end, which is love, to love one another Amen. and to also love the lost, to go out and preach the gospel to them. That's why we do what we do. Now, we've got to talk about this uh, doctrine of the uh, two offices, the pastors and the deacons. And we always want to start out by defining terms. Okay? And, and sometimes you can get a little bit of confusion when it comes to this term of a pastor. And if you would, turn over to Titus chapter 1. Titus chapter 1. Because there's more than one name for the role of a pastor, okay? There's more than one name. You have elder, you have bishop, and you have pastor, or you could also call it an overseer, which basically means the same thing. Now, if you come across these terms in the Bible, elder, bishop, pastor, overseer, these are all referring to the same office. These are all referring to the, uh, referring to the same person. It's not like there's a, the office of this, an office of a bishop, an office of an elder, an office. It's all the same guy. And you say, well, why, why is that important? Why do we have to cover this? Well, it's important because of the fact that it makes us distinct as Baptists. That's what the series is called, Baptist Distinctives. You know, there's a lot of other churches out there and denominations. They'll have, a multi, you know, they'll have all kinds of different offices in their church. You know, you can think of the, the Catholic or Anglican systems that are out there. I mean, they've got a pope. They've got cardinals. They've got, you know, so on and so forth. It goes right down the line. And they have all these different offices but when we go to the scripture which we allow to be our final authority in everything that we say and do in our practice in this church we find that there are only two offices that of the pastor which is also referred to as the elder the bishop or the overseer and that of the deacon as well so that's why it's important because that makes us distinct it makes us who we are as baptists <clears throat> now these are descriptions of the office these are not distinct offices themselves this, these these terms are all used interchangeably we see that in first corinthians or titus chapter one excuse me look at verse five it says for this cause i left thee in crete that thou shouldest set in order the things that are wanting and ordain elders in every city so he's saying he's saying ordain an elder what's he referring to he's referring to bishops or pastors and you see that in verse six where he says if any been blameless the husband of one wife having faithful children, not accused of riot or unruly, for a bishop must be blameless. So he says there, again, he's referring to the same person, right? And he calls him an elder in verse uh, 5, and then he goes on in verse 7 and calls him a bishop. So he says, for a bishop must be, uh, uh, must be blameless as the steward of God and not self-willed, not soon angry. Now, I know I've already gone through 1 Timothy, and some of this might be repetitive to those that have been coming as we've been, uh, on Thursday nights as we're going through 1 Timothy, but... It's kind of, you can't really go talk about uh, deacons and elders and pastors without talking about the fact that there are qualifications that are very specific for these offices. And, you know, we see several of them right there. You know, he, he, first of all, he has to be ordained. It's somebody else has to ordain that man into that position. Right. And ha that man has to meet these qualifications. He says, if any be blameless, the husband of one wife. You know, and let me emphasize the husband of one wife. So there is no such thing as female church leadership. Right. You won't find it in Scripture. I know it's out there. I know it's out in the world. But, you know, we let the Bible define for us what we believe. And the Bible says you have to be the husband of one wife in order to be a bishop. So if you ever run across one at the door, and, you know, and they say, oh, you know, I'm, and we do all the time. I run into a lot on the reservations when we go soul winning out there. They say, oh, my aunt's a pastor. I, I never say it, but I'm always tempted to say, oh, uh, you know, is, is, her, is her wife behaving well? You know, is, is, is she the husband of one wife, you know? Because, <laughs> I mean, is that not the qualification? Is it not clear as day in Scripture? You know, and we could turn to other passages in 1 Timothy and, and see the same qualifications given. Now, I don't want to go off on that, because like I said, we've already talked about that going through 1 Timothy. But go over to Acts chapter 20. We're defining these terms of elder, bishop, and pastor. And we see in Scripture... That elder, bishop, and pastor are terms that are all used interchangeably. Look at Acts chapter 20, verse 17. And from Miletus he sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church. So here we have Paul going in his journey, on his journeys. He's, going, he's headed back towards Jerusalem. And when he gets to Miletus, he sent to Ephesus. And who does he call? He calls the elders of the church. Now that doesn't mean he just called all the old people. 
he called here the pastors, or what they call here in this passage, the overseers. Look at verse 28. And this is him charging them. And he says, Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he had purchased with his own blood. So in verse 17, he calls them the elders. And then in verse uh, 28, he calls them the overseers. So we can see how these verses or these terms are being used interchangeably. Ephesians, go to Philippians chapter 1. Philippians chapter 1. I'll read to you from Ephesians 4. It says, And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. So <clears throat> we see there, again, this term being used, pastors. And that's referring to the office of a pastor, the office of an elder, the office of a bishop. These are all the same thing. Philippians chapter 1, verse 1, the Bible says, Paul and Timotheus, the servants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ Jesus, which are at Philippi, with the bishops and the deacons. So we see again these two offices are being mentioned, the bishop and the deacon. Now, he uses the term elder because of the fact that you know there, it should denote something about that man that is fulfilling the role of a pastor. Why doesn't he just always call them pastor? Why doesn't he just always call them any one of these terms? Because each one of these terms denotes a certain characteristic that that man should possess. And he says there that an, uh, he calls him elder because of the fact that pastors should be experienced Christians. And we see that in 1 Timothy 3. Again, if you had, uh, recalled from our teachings on Thursday night, it says, This is a true saying, if a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work, a bishop then uh, must then be blameless. And it says in verse 6, the qualifications of a bishop, not a novice. What does that mean? It's not somebody who's new to the faith. Don't take the guy that just got saved and put him behind the pulpit to teach the word of God. He should be somebody that is experienced, that has lived the Christian life, has been through the ups and downs of the Christian life, that has gone through the trials and tribulations and proven himself to be faithful. That's the person that should be the pastor, or as it refers to as the elder, someone who has gained some spiritual maturity. He is a, a spiritual elder. <clears throat> because here's the thing. I'll say, why is that important? Because of the fact that it takes experience to minister to other people. You have to go through those things so that when other people go through them, you know what they're going through. Or to deal with problems within a church. You have to have seen that be dealt with. You have to have uh, you know, experience in order to minister to others. That should just go without saying. And really what it helps avoid when you're not putting a novice behind the pulpit, you're putting somebody who is a spiritual elder, is the fact that you're avoiding the sin of pride. Because that is the warning that we're given there. He says he should not be a novice, lest being lifted up with pride he fall into the condemnation of the devil. So that's one of the dangers of putting a novice behind the pulpit as the pastor is because of the fact that, that that position, whether you like it or not, does come with a certain degree of honor. I mean, people look up to the pastor. At least they should. They should be respecting him. They should be treating him uh, as such. You know, and, uh, and if he's not a, a, a seasoned individual, if he's not somebody who you know, understands that he's receiving that, uh, at that respect because of the office that he's in and because he's earned it, that could go to his head. You know, that's, it's a possibility that it could go to a person's head pretty quick. And they could start to think too highly of themselves. So it's important that he be not a novice because of the fact that you, it takes experience to minister to others. He should be an elder because of the fact that he won't be caught up in this sin of pride. <coughs> now, what about the... So that kind of covers the characteristic of an elder, right? These are the three terms that we see, elder, pastor, or overseer and bishop. So let's take a look at bishop. Go ahead, go ahead and turn over to uh, Hebrews chapter 13. Now that's the term that it used there in Philippians 1 where it said that them that with the bishops and deacons. So he calls them bishops in that, in that one. But uh, what does bishop denote? What does it mean to be a bishop? Well, a bishop is just simply means one that rules. And this speaks to the fact that a pastor should be one that rules in the house of God. You know, we don't believe in a, in a committee-run church. You know, we don't, we don't follow that, that, that pattern. We don't see that in Scripture. You know, we're not going to have a, 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 vo a vote every time we decide to replace the carpet and see what color it's going to be or what kind of chairs we're going to get. And, you know, and, and this is the kind of thing that churches get real caught up in. They get caught up in the building. They get caught up in voting on everything and having their business meetings and things like that. And really, the real work of Christ goes undone. You know, and in case you can't tell, we're not real focused on buildings around here, right? I think this is a pretty nice one. Those of you that were in our old location think this is a really nice one, right? You, you, you realize that we've stepped up. And we should have, you know, I'm not against having a nice building and being comfortable, but that's not the focus here. 
You know, and that's why we're not going to just sit around and vote on things as a church body. That's where we're going to point a man as the pastor and say, lead us in the work of Christ. You know, send us out to go preach the gospel. And uh, that's why, you know, it refers to the pastor as a bishop because of the fact it should be somebody that is ruling in the house of God. And uh, now again, it, those, you know, just to be clear, those, that's where it begins and ends. That, that authority begins and ends at the church door. Yeah. You know, and I've been in ministries in the past where the pastor seems to think that he, he can, uh, you know, his, his, uh, his authority can even extend into your home. And there's been ministries like that where they think, hey, if you're going to, before you buy a car, you should probably come talk to me about it. You know, silly things like that. It, it gets blown way out of, out of control. And, uh, you know, but that's not to take away from the fact that a bishop is one who rules, but it has to stay within the church walls. You know, we don't want to be, you know, if we're ever in the office of a bishop, be one that is going to start meddling in everybody's lives. You know, here's the great thing about it. If you just get up and preach the whole counsel of God, you don't have to meddle in people's lives. If they come to church like they should and they hear the preaching of the word of God, it'll straighten them out for you. You don't have to sit around trying to figure out what everyone's problem is and what you need to fix in their life. We just need to focus on ourselves and preach the word of God and everything else just falls into place. So, but the bishop is one that rules. Make no doubt about it. You know, he should be ruling in the house of God. What he says goes in the house of God is what goes. Now it needs to line up with scripture, obviously. And, uh, <coughs> you know, we should respect that as a ruler. Because yes, here's the thing. Somebody has to be the boss. I mean, think about it in any other situation in life. Think about it at your work. Does your boss come to work every day and take a vote on what, what you guys are going to do? Hey, are we going to go to work today, guys? You know, the owner of the company is going to show up and let the employees decide which jobs they're going to do and which jobs aren't, or if they're going to work at all. No, somebody has to lead that thing. Someone has to grab the bull by the horns and lead it and give it direction. You know, it, it has to be that way in our, in, our, in our homes, in our places of business, where we work. It has to be like that in the house of God. We have to have somebody ruling and pointing us in the right direction us and leading us the way we ought to go. Now, look there in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 7. It says, remember them which have the rule over you. So the Bible's real clear that there are people within the house of God that have the rule over you. Now, again, I'll, I'll, I'll say it again. That's within the house of God. Okay? It doesn't extend outside those walls. Who have spoken unto you the word of God, whose faith follow, considering the end of their conversation. So there are those that rule over us within the house of God. And it's, it stops at, those, at, you know, at the church walls. It doesn't go into our personal lives and things like that. You know, the preaching of the word of God will do that for us. Now, I will say, you know, there are certain sins that if it's, that are going on, you know, then, yeah, the pastor has to step in and deal with it. Certain sins or heresies that might get preached. But really what we want to focus in on here is the fact that we don't want to forget or disregard leadership in the church. We don't want to become forgetful of the fact that it's there, and we don't want to disregard it. He says, remember them. You know, we should be mindful of the fact that there is leadership within the house of God. Don't forget it. Don't be dismissive of it. And a lot of people that they do that, you know, and uh, they they come into church and they just, you know, no one's going to tell them what to do. They, 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 or they've got everything already figured out. They already know uh, everything there is to know. And the pastor can't tell those people anything. You know, he can't teach them anything. And uh, what they are is they're, they're forgetting the fact that God has put some in positions to rule in the house of God. Now it goes down there in verse 17. You know, it's not just the fact that we shouldn't forget that they're there and be mindful of them. He also says in verse 17, Obey them that have the rule over you. And submit yourselves, for they watch for your souls as they that must give account, that they may do it with joy and not with grief, for that is unprofitable for you. So not only should we not forget the fact that there is rulership, that there are bishops, that there are, are elders, that there are pastors in the church. We shouldn't be dismissive of that fact, but we should also obey them. You know, we should listen to what they have to say. And if, if, if the pastor gets up and says, hey, thus, this is the way it is here in church, then that's the way it is. You know, if he says, this is how we're going to do things in this church, and I expect everybody to be on the same page in this area, then that's the way it is. Because that, that's him ruling over the house of God. We ought to obey them in that capacity. And here's the thing, every local church has its own way of doing things. You know, we're, we do things here like we do things in Phoenix because this is Faithful Word Baptist Church. We pattern our services after them. You know, I'm, I'm the deacon here, I'm not the pastor. You know, pastor is Pastor Anderson. And uh, we do things the way he wants things done here because he's the pastor. 
You know, I'm not at liberty just because we're an hour away to start doing things however we want. You know, we have to do things the way the man of God has deemed them to be done in the house of God. We need to obey them that have the rule over us. <laughs> you know, take heed to what is taught and submit to the decisions that are made. Now, one area that this kind of comes to mind is, you know, unfortunately, we've seen people creep into churches just like the Bible tells us will happen in, in the last days perilous times shall come. That men will, you know, certain men are crept in unawares. And we've seen this happen where people creep in unawares and they start to preach heresies or they, they, uh, they start siding with those that would, uh, you know, want to discredit our pastor or talk down to our pastor or publicly, uh, you know, revile our pastor. That's happened, you know. And, and the pastors had to get up and lay down the law and mark people and say, you know, have nothing to do with these people and give them perfectly biblical sound reasons of why those people are to be disregarded. And yet, then you'll have other people come down on their side and side with them over their own pastor. And it's not right. And, you know, they're not obeying them which have the rule over them. And it's not that the pastor's up here ruling just because, you know, he's got something to prove. You know, it says there, submit yourselves for they watch for your souls. Why is the pastor getting up and, uh, and, and ruling and reigning in, in the house of God and, 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 and demanding that people obey what is taught? Because he's watching for your souls. You know, he's watching uh, for you as they that must give an account. You know, the pastor is held uh, to a higher degree of accountability before God. For the, I mean, he's got a greater responsibility. Yep. He's watching for the souls of a multitude of people. But here's the thing. It says, obey them that they may do it with joy. Give that account with joy and not with grief, right? Well, how does that end, though? For that is unprofitable for you. And you know, when people want to disobey the pastor and disregard the pastor, they can do that. That's fine. But it's going to be unprofitable for them not for the pastor because he's not in it for himself. He's in there to protect and guide and lead the flock and to teach and build up the body of Christ. So if we obey, if we remember, it's going to be profitable for us to remember those that have the rule over us. Look at verse 24. You know, he's talking about how we ought to be, you know, we behave ourselves towards the pastor. It says, salute all them that have the rule over you and all saints. It says, salute them. You know, it, it'd be a good idea to probably greet the pastor when he walks in, to shake his hand, to say hello, hi, pastor. And to use that word, pastor. You know, that's, uh, and I understand everybody, not everybody that comes into church, if they're new to church, they've never been in church, they sometimes they'll say, they won't call the pastor, pastor. They'll call him by his first name. You know, and here's the thing, you gotta, you gotta give people space to, to, to grow. Whenever I hear somebody do that, say, you know, because pastor has a big online following and people visit, and they've not, they're not church themselves. They've never been in church. They'll come and say, oh, is Steve here? <laughs> you know? I'm like, well, maybe he is, maybe he isn't. But I, and I don't go, hey, it's pastor, buddy, you know, and straighten him out. But I'll subtly say, well, Pastor Anderson, you know, is or isn't here. You know, then I'll immediately respond by saying, Pastor Anderson. And usually people pick up on that once they hear that a few times. Once they hear everybody addressing the pastor as Pastor Anderson or whoever the pastor is. You know, they'll pick up on that. Because here's the thing, what's, a, what's one of the ways that people like to kind of passively aggressive, uh, lead, uh, you know, in a passive aggressive manner, attack the pastor by leaving off that title? I mean, we'll, we ran into a guy out soul winning the other day. You know, here he, he's going to work his way into my sermons. You know, and, and uh, I, I told, I was very polite. I told him where we're from and, and uh, gave him after the tribulation the DVD. And he flipped it over and he saw Pastor Anderson's picture. He said, wait a minute. You're associated with Anderson, with Steve. Didn't address him as pastor. That's a passive aggressive attack. Right. You know, in any w and you could do that in any, not just in the pastor, in any way, you know, uh, of just dropping a title that somebody has, is warranted to somebody. You know, and the pastor is a warranted title. You know, you don't just become a pastor because you go to a Bible college for four years and someone gives you a piece of paper. Right. Oh. You become a pastor because you meet all those qualifications, which are very stringent. And, and, and they're not easy to obtain. So, you know, we should use that term pastor because it's warranted. You know, salute them that have the rule o over you. We should show respect, you know, by saluting them and addressing them properly. Now, you know, as, as deacon, you know, I've kind of had to talk, think about this too because I, people would ask, like, well, what do we call you now, now that you're the deacon? You know, I got ordained deacon uh, eight months ago and, and, or nine months ago, whatever it was. And... Uh, and I was just like, whatever. You're like, nothing really changed. But you know what? I thought to myself, no, that there is something. You know, they, people should probably address me as either deacon or brother. 
And I took some getting used to because of the fact that I'm not used to that, you know, and I'm, I'm not one like, well, you know, actually it's uh, <laughs> <laughs> like, I feel like I need to, to be, you know, lifted up in that way or something like that. But what happens is, is people, the way they address you is the way they'll treat you, right. you know, and, and whether I like it or not, you know, being a, a, as the deacon here, it does, you know, I'm an example to the flock and, and it should be respected to some degree. I'm not saying, you know, it's anything that, you know, people have to, you know, kiss the ring or anything like that. But, you know, people will call me deacon and I'll say, hey, you know, you could just call me brother. And I call a lot of people brother. I call, you know, everyone here brother, Amen. unless you're a sister, you know. <laughs> and I say, you can just call me brother Corbin. And, but some guys will insist, they'll say, no, it's deacon. And I'm like, well, fine, you know, call me deacon. I try to meet them halfway, you know. If you insist on calling me deacon, you can just call me brother wrestle. That's a little, you know, a little more formal, mm. you know. But you can just call me brother Corbin, you know. Yeah, but uh, when it comes to the pastor, I know if somebody calls me by my first name, I, I, I just let it roll off my back. It's not like it gets, me, gets my feathers all ruffled. But I'll tell you what, if somebody calls my pastor, Steve, like if you, you know, and to the online listeners out there that are going to email the church or call and leave voicemails, if you want to have a better chance of actually getting a response, don't start out your, by addressing the pastor as Steve. <laughs> you know, if I hear him say, hey, is Steve available? No, he's not. I don't even know who you're talking about. I'll just go get some random guy named Steve, you know, and he's like, here's Steve. You know, was that, was that who you're referring to? Because I don't know, because he didn't use the pastor. So, you know, even little things like that, you say, well, that's a little thing. Yeah, but that could turn into something big. Amen. When people stop giving people the respect and the, uh, and the honor that is due unto them for the position that they hold as a pastor, you know, that can lead to bigger things. So now they just feel like, well, everyone, we're all equal here, and, and there is no ruler here, and we can all just do whatever we want. No, the Bible says that the, they are the bishop that they are to rule in the house of God right. and that we are to obey them and remember them and salute them. So we've talked about the fact that uh, the Bible uses these terms interchangeably. He uses elder, he uses bishop, and another one that he uses is pastor or overseer, which is basically the same thing. Now again, I'll point out there in verse 17, it says that they watch for your souls. And this speaks to the fact, uh, the, or it speaks to the characteristic of a pastor. I mean, that's what a pastor is. You think of a pastor as somebody who would lead a flock. He would pastor a flock of sheep. He'd be out on a pastor somewhere, and it's his job to be an overseer. You know, he'd be up on the hill, and he'd be making, looking out for danger, leading them to the proper pastures and to water and things like that. And that's what a pastor does. That's his duty to God's people, is that they are to watch for their souls. You know, he's watching out for them, and he's to be leading them. Uh, you know, to spiritual waters and to spiritual meat and to be protecting them from spiritual dangers. So um, go ahead and turn over to Acts. Uh, I think we were already there, but go back to Acts chapter 20. Actually, we were there already. Go to 1 Peter 5. 1 Peter 5. <coughs> the Bible says in Jeremiah 3, and this is a term that the Bible uses when describing uh, the man of God, is pastor. He says in Jeremiah 3, And I will give you pastors according to mine heart, which shall feed you with knowledge and understanding. So again, just like a pastor would lead an actual physical flock of sheep to a green pasture and feed them, God likens you know, the man of God unto a pastor because he feeds them with knowledge and understanding. Paul told them in Acts 20, he told the elders of Ephesus, Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers. Now what's an overseer? It's the same thing as a pastor. You get that idea of somebody looking out over the flock and, and managing it and, and guiding it and leading it. Man, he had made you overseers to feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. So just like a, phys a physical uh, herd or a physical sheep would need nourishment and water, we're the same way spiritually. You know, we as God's people, we, you know, I mean, they say, well, that's kind of degrading to liken us unto animals. Well, Jesus said, you know, my little flock. That's what he called us. He says, you know, he likened us unto sheep often in the Bible, right. you know. So, it's, it, we, of course, we're speaking spiritually here, and he's saying, you know, we need spiritual nourishment. Just like that animal needs to find a proper grazing uh, area to get the nourishment that he needs. He needs to find water to drink for the nourishment that he needs. We need that spiritually, right. you know, and that should tell us something about church, that it's important, that it's not just a hobby, that it's not just something that we do or, do, or when we feel like it. That it's something that we, sh you know, we should not forsake the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, the Bible says. Amen. That we should be in here. Because we need to get fed spiritually. Now, could you feed yourself spiritually outside of church? Yeah. But you know what? You need more than that. 
you know, there are things that you need to be taught from the Word of God, have things explained to you, and, and, and you know, that happens with the preaching of the Word of God. So you're there in 1 Peter chapter 5, look at verse 1. He says there, The elders which are among you, who also am an elder, so here he's using that term elder again, and a witness of the suffering of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed, feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof. Right? So there's that idea of an overseer again. Not by constraint, but willingly. Not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind. Neither as being lords of, over God's heritage, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd shall appear, you shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. So a pastor is a pastor because he's a shepherd, but he's the under shepherd, right? We have the, the, she, the chief shepherd mentioned here, right? And it's, it's the pastor's duty as the under shepherd of the sheep, uh, chief shepherd to oversee the flock. He's been given the oversight thereof. And pastors, you know, they are likened unto pastors. They use that term because they have a duty to protect the flock, not only to feed the flock, not only to teach doctrine and to encourage and to exhort, uh, with the word of God, but also to protect the flock by taking the oversight thereof. And <clears throat> that's why one of the qualifications of a pastor is that he be vigilant. You know, that he be, what does that mean? To be watchful, to be aware of what's taking place, to be alert to danger. You know, and the pastor has a duty to protect the flock, you know, not just from physical danger. You know, I think we all here can probably do a fair, our fair share of that on our own, right? But also spiritually. You know, to identify a wolf that has crept in, to call out heresy when it's there, to call out, you know, those that need to be called out. There's a time and place for it, you know, but uh, <coughs> that's, the, that's the job that he's been given, to protect the flock, you know, and we need this more than ever. I mean, we, we've always needed it, but I mean, the day and age that we're living in, if you were here Thursday night, we talked about it, about the fact that we're living in perilous times because men are lovers of their own selves. And there are all these attributes that are associated with them. And they creep into churches. They, they target churches. You know, these people, the pedophiles. Why do you think all these, these scandals take place in all these churches? And it used to just be, oh, it's just the Roman Catholic Church that's just shuffling these pe pedophiles around. Now it's taking place even in independent Baptist churches. Right. We have these perverts creeping in that want to just harm innocent people. They want to harm children. They want to take advantage of, of, of weaker vessels. And, and it's, it's wrong. And they need to be called out and they need to be purged from the flock. And the pastor has a duty to protect people from them. Amen. And that's why they have to be vigilant. So, you know, the pastor, when we read 1 Peter chapter 5, you know, if we haven't caught on to it already, it's not a position to be entered into lightly. You know, a pastor isn't just something, that, well, I feel like I'll, I should do that. Or maybe, maybe one day I'll do that. Or yeah, I guess I'll give it a try. No, it's a very important job. That's why it, it, the Bible's showing us it warrants so much respect and honor and that we should be obeying and saluting and remembering these people because it's a very important position that they have because they've been given literally the oversight, the protection of the flock spiritually. They have that duty. It's not to be entered into lightly. And it's interesting, it says there that they are to feed the flock of God which is among them, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint. Not by constraint. You know, you should go into the pastorate because you want to. You know, and, and we're living, you know, in... And believe me, we need more pastors. I mean, there's people that are, that are wanting good churches started everywhere. The, I mean, they, yeah, they have churches in their town, but they, they are, they're, they're preaching heresy or they're not doing the works. or they, you know, they want a good, solid Baptist church in their town. We're getting contacted by them all the time. You know, and the temptation is for just start sending out whoever. You know, but we can't do that. We can't just send out whoever. They have to be somebody that meets the qualifications. And one of the things is they should not be doing it out of constraint. Even if there was a guy, let's say he met all the qualifications, he was approved, he could be ordained and sent out, you know, that guy should want it. He should want to do it. It should not be done by constraint. Not just like, well, you know, these people want a church there and I guess I should just do it because, no, you know, I have to. I mean, obviously that's a great motive to go out and want to help people and to, and to provide a church for somebody. But it should be something that you still, at the end of the day, desire to do, you know. Don't let your wife twist your arm into being a pastor. <laughs> that never happens. That happens. Yeah. Where the wife want just the, wants the husband to be a pastor. He's just got to be the pastor. That happens. And what is that? That's constraint. Right. You know, it's somebody constraining you into that position. 
So don't enter it lightly. Just don't do it because, you know, it, you know I sh yes, it needs to happen. Yes, people are needed, but don't, you should still want to do it at the end of the day. Don't do it out of constraint. Neither do it for filthy lucre, he says. And this is a big one. Yeah. This is a big one. Because there's a lot of people that go into the pastorate for one thing, money. Because there's money to be made in the pastorate. If you want to start preaching lies and heresy and start rubbing backs and tickling ears right. and just telling people what they want to hear, you can build a big church. Right. And we could build a big church if we want to just compromise on the Word of God. You know, and, uh, and, and we could make a lot of money. And uh, that's not, but that's no reason to go into the pastorate. Right. If you're going into it for money, you know, you're in it for the wrong reason. Right. You know? And the pastor should not be one who has an abundance of wealth, right. who's just you know, rolling in dough. Right. You know? And, and we could go on and on about that. Um, but that should not be a motivation. We should not do it by constraint. We should not do it for filthy lucre. That's not to say a pastor shouldn't earn a living as a pastor. And again, this is another topic that probably needs to be preached on the idea that the pastorate is a paid position. That doesn't mean he's to sit there and fleece the flock and get filthy rich. You know, he should, he should take what he needs to survive. You know, and the rest of that money, that if there's anything left over, would go back into the work of God. We're going back into paying rent, you know, you know, pay the rent and lead a, you know, go up and uh, lead a, a missions trip somewhere. Use that money uh, rather than just spending it on a, you know, another vehicle or a bigger house or whatever. You know, that money could go back into the work of God. Right. So he says there, don't do it by constraint. Don't do it for filthy lucre and be of a ready mind. You know, be alert and aware of the position. You know, if you go to the pastorate, what you're getting yourself into. Now, I don't, I'm not, obviously, again, not the pastor. I don't even fully understand what all is involved with being a pastor completely because I've never done it. And I don't think anyone will really know completely what it's like to be a pastor without having been a pastor. But there's some things that you could probably get an idea of. Well, okay, if I'm a pastor, it means this. If I'm a pastor, it means this. You should be ready for that. You should be of a ready mind and, and, and be prepared for the, uh, what comes with that position. Not just prepared to fulfill that position, but also prepared, you know, for what comes with that position, the good and the bad. You know, and, and being ready to teach the word of God and to preach the word of God. And this all goes back to them being an elder, right? One who's experienced. So really that kind of covers uh, the pastorate. And I do want to kind of here at the end just kind of touch on the deacons. The Bible doesn't go on and on a lot about deacons, but uh, you know, being a deacon myself, you know, I would be a little remiss to not mention it. So we're going to talk about it for a little bit here. Go over to 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 8. So what is the deacon? Well, you know, really a deacon is basically the same thing as a pastor without the authority. I mean, am I not doing basically the same thing right now that a pastor does? Coming down here three times a week, preaching the word of God, taking the oversight of a flock and feeding the flock. That's what I'm doing. That's what a pastor does. But you know what? I don't have the authority to just decide, well, you know what? This is how we're going to do things here in Tucson. Because I'm not the pastor. So the deacon, in a lot of ways, is, is likened unto the pastor, but he doesn't have the authority in the house of God to make, just make calls. Now, there are certain things that, you know, I don't have to go to Pastor Anderson about every little thing. You know, about this color carpet, that color carpet, you know. Obviously, some things he, he just wants, hey, just figure it out and get it done. You know, doesn't want to have to hold my hand over every little thing. And trust you to have the wisdom and the discernment. But you know, when it comes to big decisions or if there's problems in the church, those have to be brought to his attention. You know, I can't just make decisions uh, as the deacon. <clears throat> so they play the same role as a pastor, but without the authority. And that's why the deacons have the same qualifications as a pastor. Let's look at those again, verse, uh, 1 Timothy 3, verse 8. Likewise must the deacons be grave, not double-tongued. Not given to much wine, not greedy of filthy lucre. Again, don't be getting into it for the money. Holding the mystery of the faith in a pure conscience. <clears throat> and let these also first be proved, then let them use the office of a deacon. So again, kind of likening it unto somebody who should be an elder, somebody who should have been in church for a while. You know, let them first be proved. Let them be found faithful and then use the office of a deacon. Being found blameless. Even so must their wives be grave, not slander, sober, faithful in all things. So there's even qualifications for the deacon's wife. And again, it goes back to the fact that a deacon is a man. Right. You know, the Bible couldn't be any clearer about this kind of thing. <clears throat> Ruling their children in their own house as well. So again, you can see how it should be somebody that knows how to rule, just like a pastor would. Somebody who has their children in subjection. 
Because it goes on and says, For they that have used the office of a deacon well, purchase themselves to a good degree and great boldness in the faith which is in Christ Jesus. So we see here that they are to be you know, in the same position. They have the same qualifications of a pastor, but they don't have that same authority. And they are really what they're there to do is to help the work of God, and they're there to help the pastor. I won't have us go back there to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, but when he, and he was gave those lists of diversities, you know, of offices and administrations, and one of those things he listed was helps and governments. And I believe that's something you could apply to the office of a deacon. He's somebody who's there to help in the work of Christ. He's someone who's there to govern or administer in the work of Christ. You know, take some of the load off of the pastor so that he can focus on, you know, more important things or bigger things or, or just more in general. You know, for example, when I came on as deacon, you know, the, the, the Native American soul winning had kind of fallen off a little bit. It was something we really wanted to fire back up, getting out and knocking the doors on every, uh, every door and every Indian reservation in the state of Arizona and beyond. But, uh, you know, that takes somebody leading that. Somebody has to spend the time making the maps, you know, gathering uh, the, the folks that want to go, leading it, physically going up there, booking the rooms, getting the meals, paying for everything, driving the van, and driving the van, and driving the van. And <laughs> did I mention driving the van? So, you know, and someone has to do that. Right. You know, and the pastor, if he does that, well, then this other things are going to get left off. Right. You know, so that was one of the things he gave to me. He said, look, here's, my, here's the big vision. You figure out the details on how to get it done. You know, he's got the macro vision. I handle the micro vision. I've actually had him cover it, uh, uh, do that. So that's kind of what a, a deacon's there to do. He's there to help. And, you know, and we see that in the book of Acts where they appointed deacons, you know, with Stephen and those. That the, it was the daily ministration. That was their responsibility. So that the apostles be given unto the word of God and to fasting and prayer. So they wouldn't be pulled away from the, their duties to do more menial tasks. And really that's what the deacon's there to do. You know, write, cut, write the, the rent check. And, uh, you know, order the new chairs and get the new hymnals. All those little things. We don't think about them until you're actually in that position. You know, we, as I was a church member for, you know, 17 years before I became a deacon. And there was a lot of things I, I found out real quick that I just kind of took for granted. That the chairs just showed up. That somehow the, the hymnals were just replaced magically. You know, that the light bulbs got replaced. And all these little things. that The place just cleaned itself up. And, and it was just, it was a miracle, right? No, there's people there just, they're actually doing that work. And a lot of that work is done by staff. You know, a lot of that is done by deacons and others. So, you know, it's not, it's not I don't want to say it's a less important position, but it it's definitely has importance, but it's not to the degree of the pastor. Can a church function without a deacon? It sure can. But it can get more done with one. You know, it frees up the pastor. He's a help. He's a government. And, and uh, they are there to help him, you know. And yeah, it could probably, the church could go without a deacon, but it's not a position that should be undervalued either. And, uh, you know, it's an important thing. And, you know, this isn't, a pro this isn't anything I've run into, but I've talked to others who are ha either gone into the being a deacon or are or, or being considered to be a deacon. And it, they, it's like, if they're not being, if they're, because you know, there's such a need for pastors, people are treating, some people are saying, well, if you're just going to be the deacon, like it's a cop-out or something. Like, oh, you're just, you know, you could be a pastor, but you're just going to be the deacon, you know, just the deacon. And what that is, that's an, a, that's an attitude of somebody who's undervaluing that position. Right. It's an important position. It's needed. Yeah. It gets more done in the house of God. Yeah. I mean, I think this plant down here in Tucson has gone a lot better since we've had one guy coming down as a deacon. Yeah. And not, not just because it's me, because it's, you know, Corbin, but because there's one guy that's been appointed to do that. Yeah. And there's probably other guys we could have, you know, appointed to do that, and it could, things could have gone just as well or perhaps even better. But the, the point I'm making is because we have a deacon, because we have somebody in that position, more is getting done. More doors are getting knocked on the Indian reservations. More doors are getting knocked. The gospel is being preached more in the city of Tucson because there is a deacon. More people are getting fed the word of God. So we don't want to undervalue it and just feel like just because a guy goes into that position that somehow you know, he's copped out on some other bigger calling, that position is, is important and it needs to be fulfilled. And as churches get bigger, you know, there's more of a need for that. And, uh, and, and you know, that's just, that's just the way it goes. So we should not despise those individuals. And I honestly, again, I'm not, I don't feel like anyone's ever done that to me. Despise me for not being a pastor, being a deacon. But there, I have heard of it being out there. There, there people can get that kind of an attitude where they kind of try, well, this guy, you know, he just wants this cush position as the deacon. You know, come give it a shot. <laughs> you know, first of all, meet the qualifications and tell me how cush it is. And then actually do the work. 
Because I, I haven't found that cush position yet. You know, where I, you know, where there's, you know, five hours, you know, driving one way and then coming down here first thing in the morning. I'm not complaining. I'm glad to do it. I love my job. It's great, but it's not cush. You know, it's not the easiest thing in the world. And you know what? N neither are any of your jobs. You know, there's other men here that go out and work hard jobs, ladies too, that go out. I wouldn't call your job a cush position, you know? <laughs> so, but here's the thing. Is there, is there a little bit of that stigma? Is that warranted a little bit? Yeah, because of the fact that some people do take advantage of that. Because pastors can get lazy if they allow themselves. Because the deacons can become lazy and just kind of you know, rest on their laurels and just kind of collect a check and not really do the work. And those churches become lukewarm. They become lame. The people get lame. And eventually they wither up and die. And that's what happens. So that's not what we want here. We want to fulfill these positions as pastors and deacons so that we can serve the people and so that we can serve Christ ultimately as a body. You know, we want, we want deacons. We want bishops. Not to just uh, serve some ceremonial role for us so that we can go to church and play church and feel like we're spiritual, but to actually get something done for Christ. That's why we want these positions made. That's why I was made deacon, so that something could get done for Christ. Amen. And that's why we have a pastor. That's why we go to church, is so that we can accomplish something for Christ and, and get something done. So we all have an important part to play. You know, whether you're a bishop, an elder, you know, whether you're the deacon, whether you're a church member in the pew, you know, we're all serving to the same end. You know, to glorify God, to reach the lost, and to do all things uh, to His honor and to His glory. So let's do that. That's all fulfilled positions that we have. And you know, and if there's some in the room, man in the room that would desire the office of a bishop or to be the deacon one day, we'll strive to meet those qualifications. You know, put it out there as a goal to achieve. You know, it's needed in the house of God. Uh, it's needed all across this country. It's needed everywhere. So let's, let's uh, don't undervalue that position. Consider it something to strive for, something to attain unto. And uh, let's thank God for the pastor that we have and, 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 and you know, and honor him and understand that, yes, we have a head, but we all make up that body so that we can all do that great work. Let's go ahead and pray.